Hi, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Identify People First podcast series, where we shine a light on great companies that not only do interesting work in the legal sector, but most importantly, look after their people. My name is Mark Gale. I am the business manager at Identify Global. We're a, uh, a specialist in career management and talent acquisition with candidate experience at the heart of everything we do. Today, I'm joined by Chris Stern, founder of Alacrity Law. Thanks very much for uh, joining us, Chris. Um, before we get into the topic, perhaps you'd like to give us an overview of Alacrity, but maybe a bit of background about you as an individual and what you do outside sure. of work. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for having me, Mark. Um, so I'm Christopher Thurn. I'm the founder of Alacrity, um, and we are a legal relationship management tool. And really, we seek to help organizations answer three questions. Who should they hire for corporate counsel? How much should they pay? And then fundamentally, did they get the service that they deserve? Um, the flip side of that is that we're big believers in helping law firms that are really high performing and, um, and that have um, are doing a great job for their clients. We're big believers in helping them win more business from their clients and indeed helping them find new clients. So really we're seeking to, to bring those two sides together, create some transparency in the marketplace um, and really help people uh, get more from, from their external counsel relationships. That's, that's really what we do. Okay, super. And what about kind of, you know, outside of work, uh, Chris, what's your, uh, you got any pastimes, passions? Yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, you know, it's nice to think about a time when we could actually get out of the house to uh, to pursue such such endeavors. But um, so outside of work, I, I love to run marathons. Um, so I think I've, you know, probably 12 or, or, or 15 now. So so like doing that. Um, What's your best time? Oh, best time was about 317 at one Impressive. point when I was I was considerably fitter than I am uh, at the moment. Um, but I actually had five booked for this year and unfortunately all five have been canceled. So wow. next year, perhaps next yeah, year. Fingers crossed. Fingers yeah, crossed. Absolutely. Ah, that's good to know. So um, so obviously we're, we're here to talk about kind of people. Uh, it's a difficult time right now, Chris. So in, in your opinion, what's, what's been your biggest people challenge challenge during the uh, the pandemic yeah I, I think there's a there's a couple different bits because i think there's the immediate um issue of making people feel comfortable that that you know the world's kind of burning down around you but um from a work perspective that we're we're going to get through this um and then there's the second point of trying to help uh from a business perspective um really trying to keep going right um, and keeping people motivated and 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 doing the things that we need to do to continue to pull together as a business. Um, so I think it's it's a couple different elements of it, and each of those challenges I think really um, require different solutions. Um, but I would say that's the you know trying to try you know we spend so much of our time at work. Um, if the world's kind of burning down from a from a, 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 a you know around us, we want at least some stability at work. So I think it's it's a little bit of our duty as as employers to try to help people um, you know through that and really give people some confidence that you know things are going to be okay. Yeah, I, I understand that. So you think the communication piece has been has had to be really important or, or key early on. Yeah. So so this is one thing that we always say to to our team, which is. Um, you know, one of our missions is to bring some transparency to the legal marketplace. Uh, similarly, we're going to be transparent about what we're doing uh, in the business um, as as much as as much as we can be, and that means being candid about you know when things aren't going well, or if um, you know if 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 for example you know someone's going to depart the business, um, you know we kind of don't shy away from that. Uh, we're very clear and open and honest with everyone about why that's happened. Um, or indeed, if we're hiring people, why are we hiring people and, and what are they going to be doing? And I think that extends all the way from adding people through, right, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me how many um, folks can't tell you what the financial performance of their business looks like. Um, I want everybody in our team from the, from the most junior person all the way up to understand where we are as a business and where we're going. Okay, that's interesting. And what key things do you feel that you're doing differently, perhaps, to other businesses in, in the sector? Is there anything that stands out? Um, I, I, I think there's a couple couple different bits. Um, one is I think that 
um, you know, we've we've kind of tried to not be on the back foot in terms of our response to everything that's gone on. Um, we've kind of looked around and, and tried to use it as an opportunity to grow and to help people where we where we can. Um, and that extends to helping our customers. That extends to you know reaching out and trying to give people something actionable that we can help them with. Um, and really, and really not taking a defensive posture. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy, or it certainly was easy earlier this year to really stick your head in the sand. And I think that was a mistake. Um, and I don't think it was about um, you know perhaps doing you know another seminar or something online. It's about picking up the phone to your customers and saying, hey, you know we know the world's you know a changed place. How how can we help? Yeah. And I think that's been something that we've really tried to do both internally and externally. Okay, brilliant. And in so obviously the, the, where we where we are not right now. What I mean, what does good leadership mean to your organisation, and how how are you actually applying that in a, in this remote environment we find ourselves in? Yeah, so it's a couple different bits. I think I think principally it, it again goes back to that transparency, and you know transparency, you know for for better or for worse, is something that most of the time you have to work at. Um, and figuring out right as a as a as a leadership team and 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 whatever how can we be transparent with our people in an appropriate way? Um, I think there's always um, you know sometimes decisions that you have to make that you know quite frankly you just want to convey the decision you don't want to talk about you know uh, you know the, the same the same thing um, you know laws and sausages right you don't want to see how they're made um, you know sometimes there's a bit of that but then there's putting rationale and a framework around why you've done what you've done and then conveyed that yeah. um, I actually in some senses think that's a little bit easier in a remote setting um, because you can say right you know I think there's a natural tendency sometimes when you're you know physically together to have sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations or you know whatever uh, with individual people here it's I know that I need to communicate once a week with the team, right? Everybody get on a call at this time. Everybody's hearing the same information. Everybody's starting from the same place. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's, it's, it's pros and cons. It's less personal, obviously, but it's also, um, I think, better in some ways because it's a bit more democratic. Yeah. No, okay. It's a good approach, though, yeah. Um, and, and how have you kept any furloughed staff or staff that perhaps aren't working full time engaged and motivated? Yeah, so we were we were kind of lucky that we didn't have to furlough anybody. Um, I think we all made some decisions at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, everybody. I think we we kind of gave people two choices. Um, we can either make some some changes to make sure that we were you know financially going to be okay, or we could furlough people and and do those things. And I think everybody kind of rallied around that and said we'd rather make some other changes rather than furloughing people and doing that sort of thing. So we, I think it's it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a one where um, we avoided having to make that choice. Yeah, oh, okay, well, it's a good position to be in, I guess, yeah. Um, and obviously remote working is kind of prevalent right now. So, I mean, how have you managed people around kind of working in that environment and how will that work moving forward for you as a as a business? Uh, I know from some of our previous conversations, you, you have a mix anyway, but you know, yeah. what, what's that situation look like for you as a business right now? So when we when we went into pandemic or went into the pandemic rather, um, half of our team originally was remote anyway. So our entire development effort uh, was was largely remote, um, and and I think that made it easy for us then to transition to having everybody remote. I think what we found is that most of our team don't particularly like being remote, um, and so we've tried to transition back to being in person quite quickly. Yeah. Um, I think to a greater or a lesser extent, it's hard to do creative work um, from a from a Zoom call, right? Yeah. Um, and so we've tried to get away from that. Um, and also from the perspective of people's mental health, I don't think anybody wanted to be stuck in their houses for any longer than than they needed to be. So to the extent that that we can get people back together safely and 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 of course you know it, in in compliance with all the the guidelines and things like that, yeah. um, we're, we're we're looking to do that. Okay. Um, you you mentioned your workforce was remote, uh, kind of originally. Was there a particular reason for that or a driving force on that? Was it where the talent was based or was it just a business decision? A lot of it was where the talent was. Um, I think for some of that kind of work, the more technical stuff, um, I think you can be remote, right? And have it, you know, 
uh, uh, where you're where you're not necessarily trying to cook up a new product or something like that, or or talking with customers. You know that can be uh, more easily done remote. Yeah. What I would say is, you know, for all of all of everyone saying, oh, they're remote. Well, actually, the majority of our remote team still work in a co-working space with friends and other people. Right. right? They're not, you know, sat at home, you know, by themselves all day, you know, doing something, doing a task. So I think I think it's a little bit of a misnomer that, you know, remote people aren't in an office environment, aren't aren't working with with friends and colleagues. Um, They're probably based, you know, from from our our team. They're based in a in a co-working location. They've got friends there. Okay, those friends, you know, don't work for us as a as business. Yeah. Um, but they still have that element of, of the work experience, which we think is is important. Yeah, no, I agree on that. We found that um, you know, being kind of siloed at home by yourself can often be, especially you, you mentioned it yourself, especially around the mental well-being element, is, is you need to you need to find a good balance. You mentioned your um your, your staff are uh, obviously remote in different workspaces. Are, are they all UK or are they global? And what kind of countries do you operate out of? Yeah, so so we work uh, our, we work with people who are plus or minus two hours of UK time. Um, so it's a it's a pretty broad mix, um, but it's a lot of folks spread throughout Europe. Um, we don't, you know, we're 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 just now looking at our first remote UK staff. Um, which actually presents more challenges in terms of in some of the in terms of some of the legal stuff and, and the things that you need to do in terms of employing people in the UK um, than perhaps you know staff in other locations in Europe. Okay, interesting. And, and, and in terms of the the outputs, KPIs. I mean, how, how do you measure and kind of stay on top of kind of what people are doing for you when they're kind of more remote and less office based? Mm-hmm. So, so we have a series of targets and, and a series of things that we need to accomplish, um, uh, 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 and we just continue to manage against those. I think some of those things are, are harder or easier based on being remote, but the target's still the target, and we need to we need to get there. Yeah, now understood. Um, obviously, being a tech company, um, security is kind of a a big issue. I know you mentioned that you had a mix of staff, but it's kind of just working from home or having everyone working from home presented any challenges around the security implications or systems you've got? Yeah, so um, we do every year an ISO 27001 certification. And as part of that, we have to pretty re- put a pretty robust uh, framework around what people can and can't do. And in our particular case, um, the framework for remote working already existed. Um, the other element of that is because of the nature of what we do, we get some very sensitive data through our platform. Um, so we're really a security first business. Um, and a lot of the things that we have you know, locked down uh, in terms of customer data and those things haven't needed to change because those things are already built into our, our systems as protected. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we're, we, we probably had a, had a, had a, you know, didn't have as many challenges. Um, uh, 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 we didn't have as many challenges in that respect as um, some others did. Yeah, I guess so. Being a, being a kind of, like I say, tech business, you're a kind of, probably way more advanced than, than perhaps kind of other, other more service based companies mm. so it's good to know um kind of we're getting towards the end now i mean i suppose we've we've covered off the security elements some of the tech elements you've spoken about people um kind of pandemic to brexit um how do you see kind of brexit affecting your market your industry do you have an insight on perhaps how you think the sector will change over the next few months or, or, or years yeah, I, I, th- I think I think we we don't have a particular view on Brexit one way or the other. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, anything that makes it harder for us to sell our products to businesses located outside the e- the UK is is not a positive. Yeah. Um, do I think it's going to have a massive effect on us? Probably not. Okay. Um, you know, but but again, I, I think fundamentally the, the the biggest issue from our perspective about Brexit is the uncertainty. And not understanding sort of where we think things are going. Um, for the legal market in general, 
I do think there'll be less reliance on English law, which is which is a bit of a shame. I think that will create additional complexity for businesses across you, you know Europe if we're now operating um, across different uh, across different um, uh, legal codes. But yeah. we'll have to see. We'll okay. Have to see. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's peculiar times ahead, I think, right now. It's, uh, <laughs> like you said, you mentioned it yourself, that uncertainty is uh, is the thing that's kind of stopping maybe investment or hiring or various other elements. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. And, and finally, um, Chris, what's the biggest learning and piece of advice for other leaders in your sector kind of navigating this period that you, you, you could share? Oh, boy, that's a good one. I, I, I would say probably something around the, again, the thing that I've learned the most about is is probably again being transparent. I think being I think transparency is is slightly easier when you're in an office and kind of everybody hears a bit what's going on and you know you can have conversations with people. I think where we get into an environment where you know there's a lot of uncertainty in the world more broadly and by the way there's a lot more uncertainty in the economy and things like that really working to be transparent is is something that I think is really important. Um, and I think certainly one thing I've learned is that more transparency is always better. Um, and that's what we're going to continue to drive at. Oh, great. I say that seems like a really modern and mature approach. You know, as say we've often found as a business that communication, that, that level of transparency where appropriate, obviously, is, uh, is, is things that really keep your staff and your, uh, your people engaged. I think, I think that's right. I think one of the things that people really want out of a business is is I think they want you know some alignment with their their ethics and, and goals and things like that but they also want to feel like they know and control what that environment is and how it's um, how it's going and I think um, you know the old style kind of top-down management um, you know isn't particularly conducive to that and I think that's that's going to change oh, brilliant well Chris um we're at the end of our uh, uh, kind of questions now. So, uh, and I, I appreciate your insights, your thoughts and all your comments. Um, yeah, it's been great to have you. Um, so we'll, we'll sign off now. So myself, Mark Gale, and this is uh, Chris Stern from uh, Alacrity Law. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks so much.